Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the ISBEO Safety Net webinar series. I'm Catherine Hilst, the ISBEO Operations Manager, and I am pleased to welcome Polaris Arrow back and Madeline Young uh, talking about uh, the practical application of resilience engineering. Um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items. Um, the, the audience is on mute, and um, we'll stay on mute through the duration of the presentation, but there is a question box in the GoToWebinar control panel, and uh, that is a place for you to type your questions anytime uh, during the presentation, and we will look at those um, in the Q&A se session at the end. So, um, super excited to host this series of webinars from Polaris about resiliency in business aviation and how to set the stage for practical application of resilience engineering for your organizations, and that is today's topic. Um, Madeline is the manager of Customer Experience and Safety Training at Polaris Aero. Uh, she comes with several years of experience in the business aviation sector, including a successful run as a safety specialist, ASAP manager, and Vocus SMS administrator for a major Part 135 operation. She's also a recreational private pilot and currently working on her Master's in Engineering of Advanced Safety Engineering and Management. So, Madeline, welcome back. I'm very excited for today, and I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Catherine mentioned, this is a two-part series. So um, I will be giving a little bit of a background to resilience engineering, which is really what we covered in our first episode. So if you'd like to go more into that topic specifically, um, you can reference that video. It's on the IVAC, on IVAC's website, and perhaps Catherine can throw that in the chat um, throughout today's presentation. So as Catherine mentioned, today we're going to be focusing more on the practical application of resilience for Part 91 and Part 135 operators. Now, before I jump into all of the content today, I do want to seed a couple of questions or thoughts um, for you to think about during the presentation. So the first is this, how does your organization or department define success? just generally speaking. Second, what are some practices within your organization or department that may be increasing the resiliency of your organization? And that'll become more apparent as we work through today's presentation of what those things could be that you are already doing. And then finally, within your organization or department, which of the four layers of resilience might require the least or the most attention for further development. Now, the purpose of the presentation today is first and foremost to introduce or perhaps reintroduce the concept of resilience and also to understand why it's important. The second purpose is to emphasize that resilience is already occurring in all of our organizations. It's just a matter of calling attention to it and understanding how we can systematically and intentionally work towards increasing it. And then finally, most relevant to you, is to also provide some practical application suggestions and tips of how to actually increase resilience in your own system. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna go ahead and start by reviewing the concept first. And for those of you, again, who sat in on my last presentation, some of this will look a little bit familiar to you, um, just in a more condensed form. For everyone new, like I said, go ahead and um, if you're interested in learning more about the topic, reference the previous video uh, from just a couple of weeks ago. Okay, moving on. Again, if you sat in on the last presentation, you'll remember this slide. And I kicked off that presentation by asking, what constitutes organizational success? How would you define that? Some common things that we use to define success are our growth and our profits or a lack of accidents or a lack of incidents or perhaps all, all four of those things we use as indicators. But that falls a bit short of what organizational success actually is. And so this is the definition that I provided. Organizational success is the ability of the organization to adapt to change, disruptions, crises, and opportunities and sustain its operations with minimal impact. So sure, it alludes to 
growth and um, positive numbers in terms of success. It also alludes to having a lack of accidents and a lack of incidents, but it also looks in between all of those things. And it looks at how your organization is actually performing over time, um, more just in adapting to all of these things, changes, disruptions, crises, and opportunities. Now, I further went on to suggest that this definition is actually the definition of resilience. So organizational success is equivalent to an organization's resilience. If you have low resilience, you're going to have less success over time. And if you have increased resilience, of course, you're going to see a positive um, organizational growth and success over time. Now that's what resilience is as far as the definition is concerned. Let's talk about in some other ways what resilience means and what it perhaps does not mean. So I want you to think of resilience engineering as a component of the infrastructure of your entire organization. In other words, it's a part of the DNA of your organization. It is not a safety practice. Generally though, it falls on our shoulders because it comes off as we are increasing efficiency, therefore we're also increasing the probability of things going right in the organization, and therefore by nature we're decreasing the opportunity for things to go wrong. And that tends to allude to safety and fall in our department or on our shoulders as safety managers. Now in essence, it really should be higher up on the uh, managerial scale or on the organizational chart, but nonetheless, that's not what we're dealing with today, and we won't go down that path as far as discussing how to integrate resilience as a part of the DNA. Uh, we're going to look at this more from the perspective of the safety department managing resilience for the organization. It's also about how your system performs in a holistic manner. So it's not just about how you remain safe. It's about all of those practices that transcend traditional safety management structures. structures. So it's not just about um, submitting safety reports and making sure that you're managing those. Sure, that's an integral part of it, but it's about making sure that your training is adequate, that you're hiring the right people at the right times, all the way down to ensuring that the accounting departments and the hiring departments are all on the same page as far as what needs to go on within the organization. So you can get really deep um, into all of the little organizational streams and tie that back to resilience of the organization. Now, again, I'm going to make this more practical for you. So we're not necessarily going to talk about the accounting department or the HR departments today, but I just want to see the thought that resilience is a holistic approach. What resilience is not, is it's not solely robustness and it's not solely being proactive, okay? Those are certainly elements of this or indications of a resilient organization. Robustness is more about the ability of that organization to respond or to perform under predetermined conditions or under expected boundaries or conditions. So it's a result of knowing things. So the known knowns are things that we can protect ourselves against and increase the robustness of our organization. Examples of that would be things like uh, building in checklists, training programs, having manuals, and even engineering redundancies into our system, right? That increases robustness. But again, it assumes that we have a certain amount of knowledge about how our system is going to perform. Whereas proactivity is more about predicting what would happen and planning for it. But again, in complex systems, and we'll touch more on complex systems here in a minute, there is too much variability and there are too many unknowns that proactivity only gets you so far because proactivity insinuates that you have an idea of what could happen. Okay, and we're not always going to be able to make those predictions. So proactivity is necessary. It is an element of resilience as is robustness, but we can't condense resiliency down to just these two topics. So why is resilience so important? Why are we bringing it up? Why is it a discussion? Well, it's been around for quite a while that the concept in the way that I'm talking about it today really 
for about the last 20 to 25 years has it only started to come into actual business practices. And we're just now seeing it start to filter into aviation as well, right? The topic or the word resilience has certainly been thrown around, but the connotation behind it and the way that I'm using it today is really more of a recent practice. And the reason that's important is because it's evolved with our understanding of our system of aviation. Aviation in and of itself, the industry and our organizations are complex systems. And what that means is that we are not only full of parts that are interactive and interconnected and even interdependent, but we're also full of parts that are unpredictable. And because of that unpredictability, our systems need to be adaptive. So resilience is an answer to being adaptive because of the complexity of the system. Now, why are we talking about complexity? How is that important? Well, it really has to do with the nature of our industry and the results that can happen. So we know that in aviation, if something goes terribly wrong, it could potentially be catastrophic. So the very nature of our industry is that there is potential for high consequence. That's why understanding complexity and therefore building in resilience is necessary. So in other words, think about complex systems as any system where you have human involvement, anything in the world that we exist in. Now, like I said, in aviation with human involvement and with everything going on in that system, if there are too many failures, there could be cat catastrophe. But there are also situations, there are other systems where humans are involved, where the potential for failure does not result in anything significant. So the nature of our organizations as high reliability organizations, in other words, organizations that can fail catastrophically, and because of that truth, we need to ensure that we don't, and we have high reliability, that is why it's important to understand complexity and therefore build in resilience. So have a look at um, this image on the screen here. I know you're not going to be able to read the words, and I did that intentionally. This is just a project that I had done a little while back. What this is showing you is just a depiction of a network of influences map for just one accident. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because so often we condense our understanding of our systems down to specific root causes right, or a specific root cause. That's often how accident investigation was taught, right, is to understand what the root cause is and other potential causal factors. But we've come to understand complex systems in a way that suggests there are a lot of other influences that we often miss that are still technically causal factors to a certain degree. So this here is just to allude to, again, the idea of complex systems, of variability, of all of these different influences that happen. And if this all happens in a specific way at a specific point in time, then catastrophe could potentially present itself. So we need to do our best to understand these influences and potentially put safeguards in place or understand how our organization needs to be able to respond, to monitor and to anticipate these, to move into that more resilient stage. Now, I'm not going to go deep into high reliability organizations, but I do just briefly want to talk about it. So on this screen here, what you see, you, you have a, um, a naval ship, you have a nuclear plant, a uh, power plant, you have a ATC control tower, and then you have a hospital. These are all examples of high reliability organizations. Now, these are showing high reliability in a bit of a different way, but the concepts are still the same and very relevant in aviation. If any one of these systems fail, it could potentially be catastrophic. It could have high consequence. And that is why we need to build in resilience of our systems due to the complex nature. Now, there's also a lot of information, a lot of things that we can learn from high reliability organizations themselves. And it all alludes to resilience. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these key things that we can learn from high reliability organizations. They're listed on the screen here, so I'll just go ahead and read those off. 
The first is that these organizations routinely never view past success as a guarantee of future safety. The second is that they always keep a discussion of risk alive, even if everything looks safe. The third is they listen to minority perspective, invite dissenting opinion into conversation, and constantly maintain curiosity, meaning they're always asking questions. And there is always someone with the willingness and the authority to say no, pull the trigger on something if need be. Now, all of these elements, as I just mentioned, allude to the various levels, the four levels of developing resiliency. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. So keep these four results of high reliability organizations in mind, and you'll start to see a connection between these and the practice of resiliency and how they really go hand in hand with each other. So in other words, or to kind of wrap this all up into one general idea, we are a part of a system, whether you want to consider that your organization or the greater aviation industry, that system is interactive, interdependent, diverse, and adaptive, meaning it's unpredictable, meaning that it can also fail in unpredictable ways, and it can fail with high consequence. And therefore, we must build in enough resiliency into our organizations to maintain constant success. Now, the thing is, you are already all practicing resilience within your organization. Everything that you do in your organization, to some extent, falls into these categories um, or these levels of building resilience that we're about to talk about. But we're substantiating its meaning by having this discussion today, by calling attention to what its definition is, why it's important and how it actually plays a role in our organization. So really what this is, is it's looking at all of your practices just in a different way. So similar to there being four pillars of safety management systems, there are really four key elements of resilient organizations. And it's just a different way of pretty much looking at the same practices, calling attention to it and being able to expand on those and build them. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at what those four levels of resilient organizations are. Now, the first is respond, the ability of an organization to respond. All four of these layers build on top of each other. So you can think of this in a different way as one organization might be one that only knows how to respond. One organization might be able to respond and also learn. The third organization might have the practices down of responding, learning, and monitoring. And the fourth, the most resilient system, is one that does all four of these things. It knows how to respond, it knows how to learn, it knows how to monitor, and it knows how to anticipate. So like I said, I am suggesting that all of your organizations now have some degree of safety management systems in your organization, you have some development of practices and procedures that fall into all of these categories. Now, resilient organizations aren't ones that need to have all of these categories at an equal level. So all of these don't just represent a quarter or 25% of your organization. There's going to be an ebb and a flow and a balance of all of these things happening. Really, that's just going to depend on the situation of the organization, um, current constraints that you're undergoing, if you've had a recent accident and you need to shift the organization's ability to respond in that moment in time, right? So all of these things work with each other. They don't happen in isolation. We're going to talk about responding first, and I will go through all four of these levels of building resilience in your organization. Like I mentioned, I think you're going to see a lot of similarities um, between what I'm recommending, what these definitions are, and what you're already doing in an organization, but hopefully you'll get some new ideas and gain perspective of how to actually think about these four different levels within your own organization and then therefore increase them or their presence. So let's talk about the ability of an organization to respond. Let's first define this. So 
Responding is, in other words, the ability of the company and its members to act or behave in reaction to a change or a disruption or something that has already occurred. Now, when you react passively, you will generally always be surprised. You'll always be on the defensive side and you'll always be reactive. Reacting passively is okay when the frequency of things is very low, meaning there's a lot of time in between potential occurrences so that you have the time to react passively, to be on the defensive and to build a response um, over time. But it doesn't work within systems or structures that have high frequency of events. So think about your organization, think about how many flights you have per week or even per month. The organization I come from had about 80 flights a day on average, right? That's probably not the majority of you who are on this call. You're perhaps more at one to two flights a day, maybe seven to 10 flights a week, um, if that. But nonetheless, that's still a, a enough frequency to understand that you can't react passively. A, you have enough occurrence, meaning you are flying enough throughout the week or you, you have enough legs that are going to be departing within the next 24 hours that if you react passively, it could potentially impact those other chips as well, right? So in other words, you need to be present and you need to be timely in your response. There are some other elements of responding or the ability of an organization to respond that we're going to dive a little bit deeper into. There are four items. I already mentioned reaction times and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that here in just a minute. Another element of responding is the investigation portion. How are you investigating as a part of your response? What is your process look like? Who is involved in that process? And I'm gonna point out why that's significant in a minute. And then of course, having an emergency response plan or a business continuity plan are both very important things. Every organization should have them, but it's a matter of what is included in them. Is it just a manual that sits on a shelf that you probably haven't even pulled out even when there was an emergency? Is it a living document? How is it weaved into the interactions within your organization? So let's go ahead and take a look at all four of these. The first is reaction times. Now, why does reaction time matter? And what am I talking about? Well, first, I'm talking about the reaction of a person or the individuals involved in a specific event or situation and their ability to communicate quickly that information to the necessary individuals. And then it's the reaction time of those individuals receiving that information and their subsequent processes for managing that information. So that's what I'm talking about as far as reaction times go. Now, why does it matter? Reaction times matter because our memories are fallible. And because for the sake of future prevention and for the sake of the reputation of our company, it matters how swiftly we respond to something. Because our memories are reconstructable, they are also susceptible to being manipulated with false information, or we could perhaps recount something in a different way we've, because we've let something else influence our perception of that situation. People tend to place past events into existing representations of the world. So if you let enough time pass, between an event happening and reporting that event, you are allowing any amount of that time to influence how you might actually recount that situation. Okay, so that's, that's one portion of this. There's also something that's called um, intrusion error, which can occur, which is basically a situation where information that is related to a specific situation, but not actually a part of that actual event becomes then associated with that event. That's really common in our industry because of the repetitiousness of what we do, right? Everything from 
loading up the airplane to completing a passenger briefing to actually departing to what we do in route to critical point of descent to taxing on a runway right all of those things become so habitual for us that if we allow enough time if we allow any amount of time in between an event occurring and the reporting of that event we can let our memory of other situations impact and portray themselves in how we recount this particular event. This is really all to say that our efforts of requesting timely reporting and receiving those reports is deeply rooted in how our memory works. So we just need to be cognizant of that and perhaps share um, how our memory functions with our actual working group so that they become more aware of why this is relevant. So one tip here is to include a memory exercise or a storytelling opportunity in your SMS training. So when you talk about submitting safety reports, build in there some sort of, as I mentioned, memory exercise or even allow someone to tell a story about them submitting a report incorrectly because they allowed almost too much time and their memory wasn't as accurate as it would have been had they reported um, more near to that event. Those two methods are going to resonate more with an individual and that training will therefore be more effective over time. Second is the investigation. So we need to be cognizant of how we are actually moving through the investigation process. The way we choose to investigate a situation is a critical component of response, not only in the sense of timeliness, right? Investigating in a timely manner to account for memory lapse is important, but also in the sense that it dictates the perceptions of the event by other people and it dictate what, dictates what the response could or will be. So what are some things we need to do here? Key elements of this are acknowledging that while we might be experts in the specific aircraft that we fly, or even in our understanding of safety systems, we're still limited in our perspective because we're just one person and we can't experience everything for ourselves. So collaboration is as much of a tool for sharing workload as it is for allowing us to introduce other perspectives that allow us to then put together a more cohesive and holistic view of what actually happened to increase our sense making and understanding of that event. Now, the second is to ensure not only that you're receiving information, but that you're looking into that information for the who, the what, the when, the where, and the why. Now, when we receive information, there's a certain amount of this information that we might already have because of the content of the report itself, but it's probably going to be lacking in context. First, in the account of the person who's actually submitting the report, and then also in the other perspectives of individuals who could have also been involved and might have their own recollection of what happened. And we not only need to tell the story of the who, what, when, and where, but we also need to understand the why. Now, FOQA is a great tool for understanding the what happened. The safety reports help us understand everything else and allude to the why. The why of a report of a situation is arguably, arguably the most important element of this because of the unpredictability of our system. We know through complex theory that our system will never fail in the exact same way twice. So understanding the who, what, the when, and the where is very important. And sure, we need to put risk controls in place because of that. But understanding the why alludes to how this could happen in other situations, because we know that this one isn't going to happen again in the same way. And then finally, the way we conduct conversations or formal or informal interviews matters as far as understanding the type of information we're soliciting and receiving. It's very easy for us to conduct interviews using accusatory language and not even being aware of it. 
it's very easy to, for example, call up a, an individual and ask, why did you fail to input the correct waypoints in your FMS, right? But they didn't necessarily fail. The system failed them. Now they responded to what that system situation was at that point in time, but their motivations and their goals in that point in time might have been completely different than the goal of explicitly putting in the right waypoint in the FMS, right? So we need to understand their perspective, what was going on in their environment, and we need to do that by not approaching investigations using any sort of accusatory language or by allowing ourselves to introduce bias into that conversation. Why did that person supposedly fail? Or was it the system that failed them? And how did that happen? It's also easy, as I just mentioned, to allow our own cognitive bias to seep into these types of conversations. Are we allowing confirmation bias to happen, such as are we ignoring certain pieces of information that someone is telling us because it doesn't fit our preconceived idea of that situation? Or are we only seeing the information that we want to see and blocking our retention of other critical pieces of information for the same reason? I'm not going to go deep into bias here, but it's important to recognize that we all have it. And it's very easy to allow that bias to seep into our conversation, but there are certain things that we can do to call awareness to that and to prevent it from happening in the future. One particular tip is to use the phrase and think about why did it make sense for this person to make the decision they made at that point in time? And another tip is to look for phrases or be cognizant of phrases such as the crew failed to, or they mismanaged, or if only they had just done this, right? That's allowing our bias and normative language and some of these other kind of more theoretical ideas and concepts to, to seep into our investigation tactics. Now, Emergency response plans and business continuity plans, I'm not going to go deep into, but I do just want to put up some points here. And the first is understanding that emergency response plans are meant for situational responses. And the problem with that is that if we don't exercise our emergency response plans or drill them, then we might not know how to use that plan in the situation that it's appropriate for. Another element of emergency response plans that's often missed is the need for memory items of emergency response. Not only in the sense that everyone, quote unquote, needs to know that the emergency response plan is available for emergencies, but we should know specifically what type of emergencies constitute the need for the plan and what are the first five steps of that plan. Every single person in the organization should know for their role in their organization and for particular events what those first five steps are. Because the likelihood that you're going to have the wherewithal and the ability to go and track down the emergency response plan, pull it up, filter through, and find exactly what you need when facing an emergency is very low. We all have an adrenaline rush, there are time constraints, and we need to be able to rely on memory for the first portion of a response before we actually turn to the guidelines of the plan itself. And the same can be said for business continuity plans. The only difference is that this is about an organizational response on a broader level. So generally speaking, your day-to-day -day employees aren't going to be as involved in the BCP as perhaps your IT team, your security team, your safety department, and you know, your media response team or your higher level managers, et cetera. But it follows the same concept of drilling and the need for memory items for BCP. Okay, so I'm going to come back to, I do have um, two of my next slides, which are recreation videos of how to submit a report easily, how it can be important, how it can be received and all of that in relation to being timely. I'll come back to that at the end, just assuming that there is time. I just want to make sure we get through 
the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to go ahead and skip along and we're going to move to the learning element or the ability of your organization to learn as a part of resilience. Now, some of you I imagine might be rolling your eyes a little bit and it's like, okay, well, we have training programs. We all, we all sit through you know, situations or events that we are required to learn something from, but that's not the type of learning I'm talking about. First, let's go ahead and define learning or learning in terms of resilience. It's the ability of the organization, the company and its members to acquire knowledge and practically apply such knowledge to progress the organization. Now that is pretty vague. So what I just talked about as far as having a training program and learning something from that, you know, maybe you're sitting in on a new aircraft type training session or something of that nature, or you have a new process that you're training. That's all important for learning. Okay, but that's not the type of learning I wanna focus on today. What I wanna focus on is the ability of the organization to learn from its response, to learn from after action reviews, to understand how we can learn from what I'll call the white space and how collective sense making is important in this overall process. Traditionally, we think of learning as in learning from our past and that leads us to implementing risk controls. That alludes to learning from our response. So when we learn from a response, what we're doing is we're taking into account what happened, understanding what that investigation led to as far as causal factors and putting controls in place. So learning is as much reactive as it is an actual action of putting stop gaps in place, building in risk controls, right? That is allowing our organization to learn from its past, put something in place and progress. But it's a lot more than that. So I'm going to, oops, sorry guys. So I'm gonna um, talk a little bit first, my slides are a little bit off here, I apologize, about, we're gonna focus on, um, learning from response. I already alluded to this. It's a little bit great out there on your screen there. And that is, as I just mentioned, not only corrective actions and risk controls, but what can we do differently next time, okay? Now, after action reviews, commonly we refer to this at, in, in terms of understanding, again, what happened in that investigation, what the causal factors are, and putting controls in place. But I'm talking about it in a little bit of a different way here. So after action reviews, in this sense, a review of what your actual investigation process was and how that process went, not what the results of the process was, because that alludes to adding in risk controls and preventative measures, but we wanna learn from how we actually completed an investigation, how we actually responded to a situation. What did we do as an organization or as a department that was sufficient or perhaps deficient, and how can we learn from that? In other words, what did we what do we suggest as far as work is imagined versus the work that we actually do? It's a little bit more of a, a again a theoretical term that we use in academia, but what we're referring to is how do we imagine investigations to go versus how did the investigation actually go? What were the differences in there? And then how can we redevelop our process? That's just one example of how we can use after action review in the sense of looking not just at the results, but also the process for actually completing a specific action. Now, the white space is a little bit more abstract, so bear with me. What I'm talking about when it comes to white space is understanding that we can learn from things that didn't necessarily result in a risk control. So if we have a situation that has occurred, whether it was positive or negative, the, the simple nature of sharing that situation, sharing the influences on that situation, communicating that back out to the relevant groups, what that's doing is it's giving that working group an awareness 
of what has happened and what the types of influences are that affected that situation. Now that might not be immediately important in the sense that they're going to learn something and now change the way they do their work. That's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is broadening people's perspective of how we view situations and how we understand the influences of those situations. So I'll talk about a practical tip for this here in just a moment, so bear with me. And then um, it's actually right here. So a practical tip for this is actually having a brainstorming session with a working group to understand the influences on that particular work group for a particular task. That it doesn't need to be in response to any event that has occurred. Surely you can do this in that case, but that's not necessary, right? It can just be pilots, I want to understand what the influences are on your tasks within the first 30 minutes of departure. That might not have stemmed, like I said, from an accident or an incident per se. It could just stem from a deeper curiosity of your department of what the influences are in that situation, making those influences aware and apparent to everyone so that we all now know what the pilot is experiencing in that critical time before departure. Perhaps that does lead to change, perhaps it doesn't, but that really isn't important. It's about understanding the influences that is. Now, again, this is a little bit more abstract. So what are some effective ways of actually doing this and making sense of this information? The first, or one example of doing this, is just to use sticky notes. If you're having a collective meeting, give everyone a bunch of sticky notes, give them a prompt and have them write these things down and put them up on a physical wall or a board. The nice thing about the sticky notes, right, is that you can tear them off and place them in different areas. You can start to make sense of all of those different influences and categorize them. Now in our day and age, and particularly with our pilot groups, uh, we all tend to be more remote than we are actually in one physical space at one point in time. So using a system such as Mural, which is what I'm depicting here on the screen, it's basically an electronic sticky note system where anybody can have access, create a couple of sticky notes, and anybody can come in and start to play around and categorize and make sense of that information. So it's just one example of what you can do to understand what I've been calling that white space. Okay, moving on is monitoring. Let's go ahead and define that first. It is the ability of a company and its members to continuously and systematically review information sourced from within the organization. That's a key element, that last portion of this definition, and that'll become relevant when we talk about anticipation. So first, let's just continue with monitoring. What can we do as an organization or as a department by way of monitoring that's going to increase the resilience of our organization? Well, first we can understand what the pulse of that organization is or our department. We can also use insights that are already available to us because of things that we've already done. We're already doing investigations and collecting safety reports and collecting data not just focal data, but just other reports that come into our system. So we can look at insights from that. And we know that in general, we're reviewing our flights prior to actually completing that mission. Whether you're using the VOCUS flight risk tool or you're using some other method, this is generally happening in advance of a trip. So collecting and understanding that information by way of insights is also a critical portion of monitoring. So let's look at this in a little bit of a different way. How can we understand the pulse of the organization? Well, one of the most effective ways of doing this is to regularly survey your employee groups or the organization as a whole or your department. And I say regularly, that's an important key. It doesn't mean you need to survey everybody every single week. That's gonna get a little bit monotonous. But every six months, even every quarter might be more relevant for you. And what you're looking for, as far as the pulse of the organization goes, is you're looking for how people feel about the way things are going in the organization. Do we feel that we are responding well? 
do we feel that our concerns are being heard? Do we feel that something is being done about critical things that we've already identified? Those are just three key things that you can tune into. There are a lot of different survey tools out there. We all know that. Um, but there are also several companies that can help you to develop your own surveys that are more relevant to you, right? Pulling a stock survey off the internet is only going to go so far. So you have to make sure that it is relevant for your specific operations and that it's not too cumbersome to complete, right? Another thing that you can do to understand the pulse of the organization is to actually put yourself on the front lines. Now, again, I know some of you might be rolling your eyes a little bit, because it might seem very obvious and it is obvious, but also it's almost so obvious and we hear it so much that we tend to not do this because we think that we are. So introspectively have a look at yourself, your organization, your department. Are you actually spending quality time on the front lines in a way that's meaningful, where you're actually understanding what's going on? Now, this alludes a little bit to the importance of the safety culture of the organization. If there is, um, the culture is not supportive of management being on the front lines because that uh, comes off as something went wrong, so now they're investigating me or something of that nature, that might not be the best approach. So just understand and calibrate um, these suggestions to your organization. And then the third thing that you can do is share the results of these practices, whether it is that you're surveying or you're being out on the front lines or doing both, doing neither and doing something else, that's fine too. There are other strategies as well, but sharing, collecting, making sense of, and sharing the information back out with your working groups is a key element of this because it's not only going to give them insights into what you are doing, it's going to allow them to see that your purpose is for understanding the pulse of the organization and not for anything more. And it's also going to hold yourself accountable for actually making change based on what you're monitoring. Now, the second that I mentioned is looking at your risk management insights. So this is everything from looking at your audit, reviewing your audit findings, reviewing your corrective actions over time, to looking at your your risk, uh, your risk, causal factors of issues that you've investigated over time. So we need to look at that data, make that data meaningful, so transform that data into insights to make sense of it, and not only do that, but consider it in light of the bigger picture of the organization. So something that we can often fail to do is perhaps we understand we have a, a specific set of SPIs that we've created for the organization and we're monitoring those. But over time, we've, real, we've realized that our organization is far outperforming how we expected to be performing this year in the sense of, let's say, flight hours. Maybe we only projected 50 flight hours a month, but we're on average experiencing twice that. How is that affecting your insights? How does that change your perception of those insights and provoke you to enact change back into your organization? And something else we can do as far as risk management insights is to understand and be cognizant of nearing thresholds. When we develop SPIs, for example, we commonly develop them based on a rate, so based on um, the number of flight hours per month or the number of legs per month or something of that nature. And we're generally putting in a threshold or a goal. And this alludes to the previous point that I was trying to make, which is that if, for example, we, are, we allow ourselves 10 occurrences of something, for every 100 legs. But our flying has increased tenfold and we already know that we are approaching that threshold well before we're even halfway through the year. That might signify to us that we need to enact change. So you don't need to wait until you meet a threshold to change something that could affect that, the performance of that SPI. And then finally is to look at our, um, or there's a, a tip for this as well, which is just to schedule 
a specific amount of time that's relevant to you per month to just look at those trends, right? Don't wait for those trends to meet those thresholds. They need to be looked at at a specific cadence. Now, monthly is just one cadence of this. You know, weekly might be appropriate. Maybe quarterly is appropriate. It really just depends on how frequently you fly and what type of SPIs you've created. But the point is to actually schedule time on your calendar or create a task for yourself to do this as a gentle reminder to yourself um, and also for the sake of looking back over the past year, if you were to go through an audit to say that yes, you in fact have been reviewing and monitoring your insights over time. And then finally is this concept of looking at our flight risk insights. So what types of things have your pilots been facing in advance of trips? Are you capturing that information? Are there any trends to that data? And are there any operational changes that you can institute um, because of their uh, their need. Now, in flight risk, we have actually a very easy way of looking at this information because we collect it for you. When we show you your flight risk assessment, we're already showing you what sort of things you need to be aware of that are potential stops for a trip, that are general hazard awareness for a trip, or that might potentially just be general info that is, is relevant to your specific flight that day. And what we're doing is all of those pieces of information we're tabulating over time and collecting, and we can actually display to you in a meaningful way how many times a specific rule or a specific ha hazard is triggered on assessments. And understanding what is normal for your organization versus what is abnormal and, and what that difference is, is going to provoke you, again, to institute changes before you allow yourself to get to a situation where that hazard actually had an impact and was a causal factor of a negative outcome. And then finally, we have this topic of anticipation. Now, monitoring and anticipation can often be confused, and we'll break out what that key difference is here now. Anticipation is the ability of your company and its members to detect change, developments, or opportunities within or outside the organization in advance of its occurrence. Now, monitoring is a piece of anticipation, but it is not all of anticipation. Monitoring is looking at information that you already have and making sense of it. Anticipation is reading in between the lines of the things that you could have missed. So again, looking at that white space, and it's looking outside of your organization as far as what could impact your op operations. So I've broken these up to digest them easily into two key areas. We have our macro perspective for anticipation and our micro perspective. So I'm just going to give you, again, a couple examples of what those are. The first, as far as macro perspective goes, is regulatory changes. Are we expecting any regulatory changes and how can that affect our organization? What procedures can we change, implement, or remove now to address those expected changes? Because we know that once a regulation comes out, well, certainly there is generally a calibration period that allows an organization to actually implement those changes. But if we can do so in advance of that regulation even occurring, we're that much more ahead of the game because chances are that that regulation was needed long ago. It's just because of bureaucracy and other reasons that it's been taking so long to institute. So we shouldn't delay in anticipation or in realizing through anticipation that changes are going to be necessary. The same is true for being aware of international types of standards um, and just being aware of international um, events that are transpiring as well and anticipating how that can affect your organization and what you might need to do in face of that or in light of that. And then third and perhaps more relevant to all of us right now is this idea of benchmarking. How does our organization match up to like organizations? Now there are a lot of different organizations, nonprofits, and for-profits out there that tout benchmarking. 
but we haven't actually seen an organization do this well. In other words, we haven't had an organization um, or a platform where you can view everyone based on the same funnel of information. In other words, all of these other systems, what's happening is you're taking reports and you're taking data that was all developed in a different way and with a different taxonomy, and you're trying to push it together and make sense of that. That's very difficult, if not impossible, to do. So what needs to happen is we put people, organizations on the same playing field with the same sort of structures in place and share that data amongst them or in a collective way because at that point we can all make sense of it because we're all we're, we all have already gone through the same procedures we've used the same taxonomy so it's more relevant now to each other than my organization looking at your organization who does things completely different using a different safety management system tool and a different taxonomy and then trying to make sense of benchmarking between the two okay so benchmarking is important but it's uh, difficult to complete right now because there isn't a great solution in place. So it's something to keep in mind, again, to anticipate that in the future, this will become available to us. I'm confident in that. And Polaris is working towards this goal as well. Anticipating that it will become available and then anticipating how we can actually use that information to then see what's going on at organ other organizations and anticipate that those things could happen within our own and again put potential stops in place for that. One tip is um, by way of this macro perspective is to simply subscribe to industry newsletters such as the FAST team newsletter by the FAA or MBAA Insider Daily. There are a lot of other newsletters out there um, and I'm sure most of you are subscribed to some amount of these, but my point in saying this is be cognizant of what your resources are, what biases those resources have, and then filling in the gaps due to awareness of that bias. So for example, MBAA is solely focused on business aviation. And while that's the industry that we work and live in, it's very important for us to be aware of, we should also be aware of things that are happening outside of BizAv because we all still work within the same industry and the same system of aviation. So things that happen in 121 could very well be relevant to us. And so we need to make sure that we're getting exposure to that information and not just relying on um, social media and news broadcasts to funnel that information to us. And then lastly, we'll go ahead and look at this micro perspective. Micro perspective is looking internally at your organization, anticipating what your clients' needs are and how that can affect your organization. By clients, I mean if you are a, a jet management company, your client would be the aircraft owner. If you are a department of a um, of just a general company that exists with a flight department and you fly 91, your client would then be the people of your organization that fly on that business aircraft. Okay, so understanding what your client's needs are, understanding your employee needs and their constraints, and then also understanding your organizational operating impacts. And so what I mean by that final one there is, for example, let's say that you do work for a Fortune 500 company as a part of their flight department, and that Fortune 500 has now decided to expand internationally. Now you can anticipate that you will likely also be flying internationally at this point and put procedures in place to accommodate. One practical tip for this, as far as clients are concerned, is just to check in with your clients, whether that is through a formal survey every month or every six months, or whether you're just having a conversation with them at a regular cadence. Ask them the question of, where do you expect to fly? What do you expect to be different? Higher flying, lower flying, new airports, the same airports. All of that's going to help you not only gauge how to issue your resources um, at that point in time, but also if you need to put new controls in place because of the anticipated um, actions to come. So that pretty much wraps up everything. Again, responding, learning, monitoring, and anticipating are all 
interconnected. So these don't happen in isolation. And there's a lot that we are already doing in our organizations as far as responding, learning, monitoring, and anticipating goes. But calling awareness to these groups can allow us to see what we're doing very well as far as these layers go and what we're doing poorly and what needs um, to be addressed at a deeper level. All of these things though, once you get them working in a synergistic way and you're able to expand on them time after time after time, it's going to allow you to build and bolster the resilience of your organization. So with that, we come to the end here. Um, I am briefly just going to put up a list of resources that were used to collect some of these ideas. So there is a, a slight disclaimer to this, which is that these ideas are not um, my own. Uh, many of them are from other researchers and authors um, that I've just collected into to this presentation for you. So here are some of those resources. And then also a couple of recommendations if you want to look more into some of the principles that I talked about. Um, these are here as well. I know I went through those pretty quick. Quick. If you want me to go back to them, just let me know in the chat. You can always reference the video in the future or email me and I can send this to you as well. Madeline, thank you. What an awesome tour through some really great practical tips in this area. Um, uh, we have uh, several questions and one of them is, you, you spoke about um, the, the culture of an organization. And this one is, what can frontline personnel do to uh, help convince leadership that this is a valuable approach? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And again, it alludes to something that I chose to not dive deep into because it really <laughs> requires a lot more time. And that is understanding resilience as a part of the DNA of the organization, which talks more about the culture um, and how that can be supportive and what you can do to, to change that culture and to help management see. The most effective thing that you can do is capture information. Okay, so my point in saying that is it's a lot easier to go to management, go to a director or even just your superior and lay out things that you've observed over time and have a productive conversation around actual situations that occurred as opposed to allowing, again, your memory to lapse over time and being caught off guard in an ad hoc conversation where now you're having to spitball and you're talking about hypotheticals, right? Managers and leadership are prone to being very responsive to data and to real information. So the best thing that you can do is to first submit your, your reports, not even safety reports, just think about them as operational supports. Think of them as a way to capture things that are happening, positive, negative, it doesn't matter. If you don't have a good structure in place to do that, which I do recommend everyone has, so if you don't, talk to me, we've got a solution for you. Um, but if you don't, the next thing that those frontline employees can do is keep their own log of certain things that are happening. It's, it's like having a diary for your daily organization. It doesn't need to be extremely specific. It doesn't need to be for every single thing that occurs, just as relevant situations occur, jot them down so that you can remember what those are and you're prepared to go into a conversation. Um, some, I, th I think that's the most effective approach. Something else though that you can do is request a sense-making opportunity. Really all that is, is request to have a collaborative conversation, not just between you and someone in management, but between you and your peers and management and just ask to talk about a situation, to talk about the influences of those situations, just to make sure everyone is on the same page about what those influences are. That um, tool that I referenced earlier, Mural, is just one great example of being able to do that, right? Um, so those are just a couple of things that, that you can do from front lines in order to do that. Now, again, it takes a culture to support this in the long run, but any individual is capable, regardless of culture, of keeping track of this information over time to be prepared for those conversations. Awesome, awesome uh, 
tips there. Thank you. Um, I have two questions here that seem to address kind of the same thing. One says, how can an organization make space in its daily operations for this type of continuous communication? And then the other is, given that many safety managers are also full-time pilots, <laughs> what types of approaches have you seen people diligently parsing out their work week to actually put time into each of the four pillars outlined today? So yeah, this like, how, how, how have you, or what are your thoughts on making time for this? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I, I tried to allude to this. I know coming from a big 135 where we had our own designated department and it was my job, this looks a little bit different in your day to day. So for yeah. those part 91s or even those smaller 135s that are pilots or that don't have a lot of time, this doesn't take time, okay? Because it is already woven into everything else that you're doing. So it's just a matter of being present and aware of what you're doing and how it impacts the resiliency of your organization. So that's part one, is just to approach this as, I'm already doing this, I just need to make sure I understand in that moment in time, the significance of whatever it is that you're doing, right? We are already receiving safety reports, we're already required to process those to a certain extent. So it's a matter of, recalling some things that you've learned about this through this presentation and being present in that moment. However, sometimes we do need to set aside specific time in order to achieve some of these goals. For example, learning, right? We already have so much information in our system. And, and by system, I'm not only talking about a platform like Vocus, right? In our platform, Vocus, any, everything that comes in, you can pretty much share in some way as far as insights or information goes back out with your, with your group. But if you don't have an SMS tool as sophisticated as this, you are still having conversations, whether that's via email, whether it's through some other SMS tool, um, whether it's just in a, a, a monthly meeting that you have. So it's just a matter of carving out five to 10 minutes of whatever time you are already dedicating to managerial tasks and sharing a lesson from something that you learned based on those tasks. So for example, if you know that every month you have a monthly department meeting, take five minutes of that meeting, say, hey, this is what I learned from last month's data or from from our last months of uh, worth of flying or hazards that we've been presented with it doesn't necessarily mean that you've instituted any changes it's just hey this is what's been going on that five minutes alone is now going to increase people's awareness and increase their perception of what it is that you are doing as a safety manager something else you can do is literally just block off five minutes of your day in the middle of a week, you might have to move it around if you're flying or something, to take a safety report, convert it into a lessons learned, and just publish that back out to your employee group. So we're kind of talking about the same thing here, but just in a more electronic form. So it doesn't take a lot of effort to do any of these things. It's just a matter of being aware of the need to do these things in particular moments in time when you're you're completing other similar similar tasks. That makes sense. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I, one, a question here about: Do you feel like uh, flight departments are using their COVID response as a data point in their organizational resiliency um, as a place to build from? Have you seen that? Absolutely. Many organizations have had the forethought of looking back at their COVID response using after action reviews to understand how they progressed through uh, the pandemic, how they made certain decisions, things of that nature, to improve plans moving forward. A lot of organizations have not. So it's just a matter, and again, this comes down to resource constraints and having the time to do so, but that is an excellent example to understand how your organization performs under stress and how it can be resilient. Now, like I said, we've if, if we are still here, we are already resilient to an extent, right? We have adapted to unpredictability in some to some extent. Some have done it a lot better than others. And where you can find the information is by looking retroactively at that white space 
at how you made decisions, how communication happened, and come together, do a little bit of mind mapping, understand those influences, and share them collectively. That way, the next time around, everyone's aware or aware enough to the point where things will go at least a little bit better. Interesting, um, because this goes a little bit to one of the next questions, and I think something that you said earlier in the, the presentation of how many organizations already do this, they just don't, maybe don't think of it consciously. So what you're saying is that um, by using some of the programs we already have with SMS and all of that, by, by looking back at our our conduct during certain things, we can maybe lay a path forward and, and actively become a more resilient organization. So that's my little sort of munching of that, which hopefully um, is, is on point. But the question that made me think of that is that uh, you mentioned that most already do resiliency type things and what percent would you say actively have a resiliency program? And, and I guess I would take that further to say how many have like realized they may have this already there and have made it up, a, a, you know, a, a conscious thing. That's an excellent question. Honestly, it's one that there aren't statistics of and that I would just be guessing if I were to uh -huh. give you any sort of percentage or answer. My suspicion, however, is that actual awareness in this way of your organization being resilient is fairly low. And so my goal, particularly with this series, is to increase that awareness and to change our perspective on what we can do in our systems to make sure that things are going well. And it's it's hard to do because there are already other structures in place. Yep. And sometimes we can already feel overwhelmed by that. And so what I'm intending to do is, is say, again, all of those pillars of SMS fall into each of these categories, but these categories are almost more approachable. If you think about, we need to know how to respond, we need to know how to learn, we need to know how to monitor, and we need to know how to anticipate, if you do anything under those categories, under all of those categories, you are working towards those four pillars of SMS in general, yep. and you're increasing your resiliency. So as far as awareness goes, I think it's fairly low, but hopefully we're getting there. Yeah, that's that's awesome. That was a, a big um, sort of connection point there. Of we're doing these things, we just need to sort of revisit how we're we're talking about them. So I I really appreciated that. And um, the last one is actually from me. <laughs> And um, and it has to do with um, your idea of having a memory exercise, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on um, uh, it. Flashed in my brain that like during an ERP drill, that that might be a place um, where you could include a memory aspect. And I don't know how many places do this, um, where you have a, a you know people are going to be asked about their recollection of what happened but what what do you think about incorporating something like that as a i guess this would be more on the tip thing into an erp drill that you're you're and see how people's memories diverge i think that's that's an excellent example not only in becoming aware of how people's memories diverge but understanding that our personal recounts of things that we were personally involved with and our recounts of things that we witnessed, both of them are always going to be situational and they're never going to be 100% accurate. But that does not invalidate them. It is extremely important to have witness statements and to have your own personal accounts as best as you can remember. What that does is it gives us insights into how you perceived something. That information is actually very interesting when you look at accident investigation studies in general, right? Because it alludes to how, how that line of thinking even developed over time. Was it institutionalized or was it not? If it was, now you have an action item that you can take back to your organization to institute change so that that same perce perception of that situation changes. Some of this has to do with goal conflict, right? When we're in a situation in a critical moment, we generally in that moment in time have very specific goals that we are trying to achieve and everything else doesn't matter. Right. So understanding what those goals are, why we felt that those were goals at that point in time can allude to deep rooted assumptions and values of an organization. So I know I kind of strayed a little bit away from the topic there, oh. 
but my my point is yes having those types of memory exercises in emergency response drills is um a fantastic idea yeah and and you took it to the next next level there of the information that you can get the valuable information that you can get from doing that not just the practice itself but the the information you can glean from that as an organization exactly and often we fall short of that so it's just a right. matter of taking what we're doing just to the next level and we can use things that we've already done we can still learn from things that are a year two years old it doesn't matter how old it is um we can still learn from all of that and understand what the thought process was behind that situation how it was investigated how we can change that moving forward to make it more um, holistic and aligned with uh, resilience practices Fantastic. We already have some of those the, that that information available to us. That's great. Um, Madeline, that that was it for the questions. As always, this was fascinating and brought up a whole bunch of uh, really terrific thoughts and ideas and um, suggestions for ways to actually utilize this and shift our focus. So I really appreciate that. Um, I know we will be seeing you guys again on the Safety Net webinar series. Um, Madeline's information, her contact information is on the slide on the screen. I wanna thank everyone for being here today and this will be available as a recording. So you can just go to the IVAC website um, to the webinar page and uh, I put that link in the chat earlier. And so um, I hope you all will stay in touch. Um, and that is it for today. I wish you all a safe and happy holiday season. And uh, Madeline, thank you and everyone at Polaris again for doing these. So appreciate it. And we'll see you all soon. Thanks. Bye-bye.